Okay, good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds. The Grand Rounds have a slightly different flavor today, and welcome to those who are kind of watching this uh, on the webcast. Surgical Grand Rounds, our surgical part, basically of Heart Center Grand Rounds, but really I think the lessons you're going to hear uh, that Bill's going to talk about can be applied to anybody who's doing interventions. And so it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Brown. He and I have known one another for a long time. Um, and he's a little different, as you'll see. He graduated from University of Michigan with a BA in philosophy, completed medical school at Wayne State, uh, and a surgical internship at Yale, and then completed his general surgery residency at Medical College of Ohio, and was one of the first two vascular fellows actually ever trained at uh, Mayo Clinic. So here's where he's a little different. He's a graduate of Detroit College of Law, so he's MD, JD and is a member of the State Bar of Michigan. He's a professor of surgery at Oakland University at William Beaumont Hospital. And Beaumont is very similar uh, in many respects to Methodist Hospital. It's kind of a big uh, organization with a very active cardiovascular center. And he's presently the vascular surgery program director and chief of the section of vascular surgery at, at Beaumont Hospital. I won't go into his other accolades because we really want to hear what he's going to tell us. Uh, he gave a little presentation uh, for the community surgeons last night. I can tell you there's a lot of discussion and a lot of questions uh, from our faculty and from fellows alike about some of the medical legal aspects. Last night he was talking about um, the various rules and regulations that govern our uh, life and health care. Today it's going to be a little bit more focused um, on on, on what we need to know about uh, malpractice. So, Bill, thanks again for coming down. It's a pleasure listening to you last night. All righty, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alan. It's certainly a pri uh, privilege and an honor to be here today. Um, when I was training, when I first started my training, if anybody had a problem with their heart, they went to Houston and they saw Dr. DeBakey at Methodist Hospital. If anybody had a problem with uh, aneurysm, they went to Houston, and they saw Dr. Crawford. Um, although the faculty has changed a little bit, what hasn't changed, obviously, is that Methodist remains a world-famous center of excellence in cardiovascular disease. And it's certainly my honor and pleasure to be here and speak to you here this morning. Um, I have no financial disclosures. If you practice medicine, there, they say there are two things that are certain in this country, death and taxes. Let me give you the third one. <laughs> you practice medicine long enough in this country, you're going to be involved in a medical malpractice suit. And so it's very important that you understand how the system works so that you can help your lawyer give you the best defense possible. Okay. So if a lawyer wants to sue you for medical malpractice, he's got to show four things. If he doesn't show all four of these things, the lawsuit has to fail. First, he's got to show that there's a physician-patient relationship. Two, he's got to show that you breached the standard of care. Three, proximate cause means what you did actually caused the damages to the patient. And four, damages. It sort of works on a uh, playground basketball rule, no harm, no foul. Okay, physician-patient relationship. How do you get a physician-patient relationship? Well, obviously, a patient comes into your office, you see them, you examine them, you got a physician-patient relationship. Um, you get a consult in the hospital, you go see them, you got a physician-patient relationship. Well, what if you get a call at night from the emergency room physician or your resident, and they call you up and they say, Dr. Brown, I got a guy down here, he's got a problem with his foot, I think it's okay, why don't you come in and see him in the morning? And I, you don't have to come now. And I go, great. And I go back to sleep. Next morning, I go in. The foot's dead. And I go, well, looks like you got a problem, but I never saw the guy, so I don't have a relationship with the guy. That's wrong. Okay? I have a relationship. Once you take that phone call from the ER doctor and accept that patient to talk about that patient or from your resident, you now have a physician-patient relationship with that patient. Um, as far as social setting, I'll talk about that in a, setting, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Sometimes in social settings, you could end up getting a relationship, or the court did, could determine that. Sidewalk consult. All right, what's a sidewalk consult? Well, I'll be walking down the hall. Doctor will come up to me and say, you know, Bill, um, I got this guy who's got this, this, and this. What would you do? How, how would you take care of it? And I go, well, you know, if I saw that patient, I'd probably do A, B, C, and D. And he goes, oh, oh thanks. I appreciate that. He goes back to the chart, and he writes down, thoroughly discussed case with Dr. Brown, who's chief of vascular surgery, and he suggests we do this, 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 and this. Okay? I mean, I had no idea that that's going on. And suppose what I suggested doesn't go very well. Do I have liability? And the answer is no. 
I have no liability because I have no physician-patient relationship. I didn't see that patient. I didn't talk to him. I wasn't consulted. On the other hand, if I'm walking down the hall and he says to me, hey, would you just put your hand on this guy's abdomen and see what you think? And I go in there and I put my hand in the abdomen and I go, nah, it's okay. Now I own him because I got my fingerprints on him. Okay? So the point is, is that now I do have a physician-patient relationship. Last thing is, people talk, well, I didn't charge the guy. I mean, I saw him, and I, I didn't charge him anything, I, and I took care of him. I, I, ha I shouldn't have a relationship. That's absolutely false. So the important thing to remember is, you're getting sued anyway, charge everybody. Okay? <laughs> All right. This is what I was talking about in a social setting. This is a case, actually, that, that occurred. Uh, there's a guest at a party, he asked this vascular surgeon, says, you know, I got a three-month history of uh, swelling in my leg. Is that significant? And the surgeon says, well, you know, you've had it for three months. That's probably not significant, but you probably ought to go see your doctor. Uh, the individual doesn't go see her doctor because she says, well, he told me it's probably okay. Um, one week later, the patient had a PE and died. So now the question is, was there a physician-patient relationship established? Everybody would argue back and forth. We would argue, no, I didn't see him in the office. I made a little comment at a party. I didn't have a relationship. Plaintiff attorney is going to argue, wait a minute, she relied on you. You told her it probably was okay. So she didn't even go see her doctor. So again, this is what's different about the law. There is no black and white. Everything or almost everything is gray. Okay, but well, once you got this relationship, how do you get rid of it? Okay, number one, you can get fired. Now, many of you younger people out there say, no, I'm a great doctor, you know, I'll never get fired. Trust me, you will be fired. And in some cases, you'll be very happy you were fired, okay? <laughs> you two probably don't understand right now either. Uh, but you can get fired, that's one way. Second thing is, you can withdraw from care after giving the patient sufficient notice. So in other words, you do the patient says, a vascular surgeon, I do his carotid. And the guy's really difficult to take care of, and I just don't want to take care of him anymore. Okay, I can, after a period of time when he's okay, say to him, you know what, this is not working out. You need to find another doctor. I can send him a letter and say, you know, you need to find yourself another vascular surgeon. What I can't do is get a call on that guy, you know, a year later or six months later, and he's in the ER, and they say, uh, Dr. Brown, your patient, Mr. So-and-so, has got a ruptured aneurysm in here. I can't say, you know what, I didn't like that guy the first time I took care of him. I'm not taking care of him now. Get somebody else to take care of him. That I can't do, okay? I've got to get him sufficient notice. And there's some question about resolution of patient's medical problem. If I did his credit five years ago, is he still my patient? Again, subject to interpretation and argument. All right, standard of care. We're always talking about the standard of care. And if you ever give a deposition, or you talk, they're going to ask you, doctor, how do you define the standard of care? The legal definition of standard of care is what the ordinary physician would do under like or similar circumstances, all right? It's not what the average physician, because obviously by definition, if it's what the average physician would do, 50% of physicians are committing malpractice every day, okay? So it's not average physician. And it's not the best medical care. It's what the ordinary physician would do under those kind of circumstances. All right, well, how do we establish the standard of care? Well. Most of the time, it's done with an expert witness. You bring in an expert who is an expert in the field and says, hey, this is what should have been done. The doctor breached the standard of care. You can also establish it by the defendant saying, yeah, I breached the standard of care. That's obviously the least common way that it's established, okay? Somebody doesn't come in and say, yeah, I violated the standard of care. There's res ipsa loquitur, which is the Latin. It speaks for itself. If you leave a sponge in somebody's abdomen, you don't need an expert to say, that that's negligence, all right? Plaintiff, uh, the plaintiff himself can be a medical expert and that can be established. And finally is common knowledge, all right? If you have a patient who's six weeks pregnant and you decide, you know, I think I'll get a little information. Let me start doing x-rays from head to toe and I don't think I need to shield her at all. Obviously, everybody knows you can't do that. That's common knowledge and that can establish the standard of care. Uh, the standard of care is a national standard. The national, your standard of care here in Texas is the same as it is for me in Michigan, is the same as it is for a little town in the upper peninsula of Michigan. The standard of care is the same all across the country. Now, what does different, di differ a little bit is what we call the locality rule. And the locality rule usually has to do with hospital equipment. 
So if somebody comes in and says, um, there's a small little hospital, and somebody comes in and says, you know, you should have had a 128 slice CT scanner of this patient, and then you would have known and made this diagnosis. It's perfectly reasonable to say, wait a minute, I barely got an x-ray machine up here in my little hospital. I don't have these kind of equipment. And that's a, a, a liable defense, that you can say. The standard of care is different for fellows and for residents than it is for attendings. The other biggest problem with standard of care is to keep changing. It, it's a very fluid type thing. And it just, I give two examples here. You got a patient who has an isolated two centimeter common iliac artery stenosis, 90% short segment stenosis like that. And they're not calcified. I mean, it's just a straightforward. Now, if someone was to do a femoral femoral bypass on that, is that outside the standard of care? Or an iliofemoral bypass? Is that outside the standard of care? And the truth is, in this day and age, it probably is. It probably is no longer within the standard of care. Something I grew up with and I did all the time as a resident and as an attending in my early years is probably now outside the standard of care. So if that patient had an MI following a fem-fem, you're probably going to have some trouble justifying that. Similarly, you got a patient who's got 75 years old. He's got perfect anatomy for a stent graft, okay, for an aortic stent graft with an aneurysm, and he's got a history of coronary artery disease. Could you do that guy open? Well, years before, we could do him open. Today, I would argue that you can't because the ordinary vascular specialist at this time would do this patient with an endograft. So again, it keeps changing. Proximate cause, all right. Proximate cause, again, what you did has to cause the problem. Again, this is another case taken from the case books. Uh, patient, uh, what happened was they did an aneurysm on the patient. Patient died first post-operative night following this open resection. They did an autopsy on the patient. They did a patient sued. They did an autopsy on the patient. They found a sponge in the abdomen. Well, there is no recovery for that retained sponge because that didn't cause the patient's death. So again, what you did actually has to cause the damages that they're alleging. All right, informed consent. Another thing we like to talk about. Unfortunately, this is the approach that a lot of people take to informed consent. And it's not only just physicians, but it's also patients. You'll have patients who are coming to the office, well, okay, listen, I'm going to do your aortic aneurysm. Let me talk to you about the, I don't want to hear about the risks. Don't, don't tell me about the risks. Or you'll hear, you'll be taking care of a, the patient, the patient's 75, 80 years old, and the, sibling, the child will come in, patient's child will come in and say, don't tell mom and dad about any of the risks. They really can't take it, all right? Don't listen to the child. <laughs> tell them about the risks, okay? You have to tell them about the risks. So how can you do that? How do you document that? Well, some people love this little phrase, risks and benefits discussed, and that's all they put in. Let me assure you, that does not constitute informed consent. Any good attorney um, will look at a note and see that it has all these components. Number one, you got to put down the diagnosis. Number two, you got to put down the treatment plan, what you're going to do for them. Number three, you got to put down the risks and benefits of that treatment plan. Four, you got to give them all the treatment alternatives and the risks and benefits of those alternatives. And five, you got to give them the prognosis with and without treatment. That's informed consent. Uh, you have to tell a patient anything that could affect their, de uh, their decision whether or not to proceed with treatment. And that's the underlying theme. Anything that could affect their decision whether or not to, go to, to uh, undergo the procedure. Now, interestingly, you all have in Texas, you have this disclosure panel. And they decide, does the procedure require specific informed consent? What constitutes informed consent? And you have to then, once you have written that down, you've got to give it to the patient. And they have to sign it, and it has to be witnessed. Now. For example, I looked this up um, on the uh, panel's uh, uh, literature. Uh, open surgical pair aortic subclavian and iliac artery aneurysms or occlusions and renal artery bypass. What has to be included? According to the panel, you have to put down hemorrhage, paraplegia, kidney damage, stroke, acute myocardial infarction, and infection of a graft. What was very interesting to me was you don't have to list death, which I thought was very interesting. I did look under coronary artery bypass grafting, and you do have to list death, death there. 
So it's okay, I guess, to list that as a complication, but that shouldn't be a complication or an aneurysm. That's an unacceptable complication of death, which was a little frightening to me and made me glad I don't practice here because uh, that could be a problem. Um, one of the other things about informed consent uh, is how much do you have to tell the patient about your experience and what you've done? This is, again, a very classic case I used to teach with my law school class, Johnson versus Kokomore. Dr. Kokomore got out of uh, his training program. He's a neurosurgeon, and um, he went into practice in a community area. A patient came in with a posterior cerebral aneurysm. Um, they said to Dr. Kokomore, do you do this? Do you? He said, oh, man, I've done plenty of aneurysms. I've done plenty of cerebral aneurysms. Well, in fact, he had never done a posterior cerebral aneurysm. He had done a bunch of anterior cerebral aneurysms. And he figured, well, they'll never know the difference. Aneurysm is aneurysm. So I'll just tell him I did a bunch of aneurysms, OK? Well, what happened is the patient didn't do well, obviously, and he sued. And the court said, you know what? You have to give the patient, especially if they ask, what your experience is. So if they said, how many have you done or what have you done, you have to be truthful with them and tell them. And if you don't, if you're not truthful with them, then you have not given them informed consent. Now, for the younger people who are just getting ready to go out and practice, you know, it's not like a patient comes in and they say to you when you're first in practice, well, well Dr. Brown, have you, have you done carotid surgery before? No, I haven't really done it in practice. You're going to be my first one, and I'm really excited about doing this, okay? You don't have to tell them that, okay, because you're allowed to count your training. But if someone says to you, you know, how many of these difficult cases or you do have to be truthful or you have not given them true informed consent. Okay, another thing is, and again, this is a distinction that very few people know. Informed consent is not the same thing as your consent form. That little form that they sign right before they go into the operating room for a surgery or for the cath lab or whatever is a consent form. That protects you against criminal and civil battery. It has nothing to do with malpractice per se. It can help in malpractice, but it, pr it protects you against criminal and civil battery. So why is that important? Well, why that's important is, is that your malpractice insurance doesn't cover civil battery. So if the plaintiff attorney decides, hey, you know what? I can't really prove negligence. I can't get an expert, but I can prove a civil battery. And the court says, well, you know, that is a battery. Uh, there was no consent form. <clears throat> we're going to find for the plaintiff $300,000. That's coming out of your pocket. Your insurance company is not paying a dollar of that. So again, make sure you have both informed consent and a consent form. Uh, again, one of the things that we talk about here is obtaining informed consent is a non-delegable duty. There may be some question about this, but most courts are pretty consistent that don't send your resident in to get informed consent. Don't send your fellow. Really, don't even send your partner. If you're doing the procedure, you go in there and get the consent. Okay, now as far as medical records go, anything written in preparation for litigation is privileged. I will occasionally see patients who I just know are going to be a problem. Sometimes anybody who's practiced for any amount of time can talk to certain patients, and you just see the buzzsaw coming down the road. You know, you can just talk to this patient and go, this is going to be a problem. I know this is going to be difficult. So you can write down anything you want in preparation for litigation. And you just put a little note. I just keep it usually in my desk. I don't put it in the um, electronic medical records. I just keep it in a little chart in my office. And I can put down, patient did this, patient did that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If that comes to litigation, I have the option of either showing that to somebody or not showing it to somebody, OK? I ha it, it is not discoverable. And I usually will do that if I'm concerned about this is going to be a problem. Because it's very difficult for any of you who have been involved in this Two years later, you get this lawsuit, and it's usually from somebody who you thought you did a great job for, and you're trying to remember, what, what went wrong here? What happened here? And so it's nice to have notes like that. Um, you also can't give records to discuss patient's condition with anyone unless you have the patient's written permission. So a lot of times you'll get a call, um, say you took care of a patient and another doctor took care of a patient, and the other doctor got sued and you didn't. His attorney or her attorney will call you up and say, yeah, this is terrible. Well, we're going to get this plaintiff. We're working together on this, right? No. Okay? As I say a little bit later, medical malpractice is not a team sport. It is an individual sport. It's everybody for themselves. Okay? Now, in Texas, the law states that you have to, the patient has to give a medical release when they file the lawsuit. 
So they have to give a release for all, for all release of their medical records. So basically you could do that, but I would suggest that you don't talk to anybody until you talk to your counsel before you give away any kind of information, even if you're not in named or involved in the suit. Okay, medical records are basically the paper trail. And I always tell my residents and fellow, if you don't write it down, didn't happen. Uh, you gotta take time to write down your thought process, not just conclusions. We're all busy. We all sometimes can't find a computer. At least in the old days, you know, you had the chart in your hand, you wrote a little something. Now you gotta go find the computer and you gotta sit down and you gotta log in and you gotta do this. It's worth it. Take the time to write it down. Let me give you an example. You got a patient comes in the emergency room, they got a four centimeter aneurysm. And they've got some abdominal pain, back pain. So you examine them and you go, well, the back pain is, I don't think this is anything. I think maybe they reached. But you know what? It's got a four centimeter. I'm just going to bring them into the hospital and I'll keep them in overnight maybe, and see what goes on. All right. So now you bring the patient in the hospital. You can write one of two notes. First note, patient has a known abdominal aneurysm and back pain. We'll admit and observe. It's basically what you're doing. Or you can write this note. Patient has a known abdominal aneurysm and back pain. Although back pain can suggest possible expansion or rupture, I do not believe patient's aneurysm is symptomatic. However, we'll admit and observe situation discussed with patient and family, all state they understand and wish to proceed with present treatment plan. When that guy ruptures at two in the morning, which note do you want to have on the chart? Okay, it's not hard to figure out. All right, office practices. And I, I make this comment because I have seen cases and reviewed cases. Document phone conversations with other physicians, okay? If you're a surgeon, and you call a medical doctor and you say, hey, can I go ahead and do the guy? And the medical doctor says, yeah, 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 go ahead. He's fine. You can go ahead and do it. All right? This was actually a case that happened. He said, yeah, yeah, that's no problem. Go ahead. He's cleared. Patient had a problem postoperatively, medical problem postoperatively. They asked the uh, uh, medical physician, did you clear this guy? There was nothing in writing. He said, I, I might have. I don't, I don't have a note. I don't really remember. So as I say, once the lawsuits start, colleagues, de colleagues develop amnesia. They don't really remember. They don't say they didn't, but they go, yeah, I'm not sure I did. Okay, don't be in that position. Make sure you get those things in writing. Make sure in terms of your notes, make sure that they are legible. Now we don't have so much trouble with writing. But you got to make sure they're clear and concise. People are looking at it. They're reading your notes. They are a reflection of you. Uh, these uh, couple of notes I'm going to show you are actual notes that were taken out of charts, okay? Patient was shot in the head with a 32 caliber rifle. Chief complaint, headache. <laughs> really, okay? Patient referred to a hospital by private physician with green stools. Doesn't sound great. Patient's been married twice, but denies any other serious illnesses. <laughs> That's more or less funny depending on your, on your situation. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorites. Mycostatin vaginal suppositories, number 24. Insert until exhausted. Okay? Again, you don't want to have these kind of things on your chart. All right. Good Samaritan acts. Another thing that you need to know about is Good Samaritan. When people think of Good Samaritan, we think of Good Samaritans the um, roadside, people being on the road and, you know, stopping. Good Samaritan acts can also apply in the hospital, and they can apply in the operating room. A very famous case that actually happened to involve my home institution, Beaumont Hospital, uh, Groton versus Beaumont Hospital. A patient came in the emergency room from a uh, car accident. They needed a general surgeon. Um, and what happened was the general surgeon, they couldn't get a hold of him. So there was a general surgeon walking through there, and they grabbed him. Okay, And he said, you know, we can't get the guy on call. Could you take care of this guy? He was not on call. He had no duty to do it. He took care of the patient. Because he had no duty to do it and he was not on call, he had no liability, okay? He was a good Samaritan. We often get called as vascular surgeons, you know, can you come down to room six? We got terrible bleeding, we can't control it. If you are not on call, then you have no liability. Now, in the state of Texas, there is some little caveat that says, for expected remuneration, you could have liability. However, the argument would be, hey, you didn't expect any remuneration. You just went in there to save the guy's life. If you get paid for it, that's great. But you didn't see the guy preoperatively, so you didn't expect to get paid for it. I would be happy 
to go in front of any jury and say, yeah, I went in and I saved this guy's life and he got a wound infection. I don't know a jury that would find you liable for that. Um, and so again, um, I, I think that you do have protection for those types of things, as long as you're not on call. If you are on call, you now have a duty. And so now all that comes down. The only thing that you still will be liable for is what we call willful or wanton acts. Willful or wanton acts are things such as, suppose I save this guy's life, and I say, you know what, I want this guy to remember I saved his life. So I carve my initials in the bottom of his abdomen over here, okay? That's willful wanton, okay? That I'm gonna be subject to liability for. But aside from that, you're really not gonna be subject to any kind of liability. Um, again, as I said, medical malpractice uh, litigation is not a team sport. Um, and this is a cartoon I love. It says, basically, I think you can read it. Would everyone check to see if they have an attorney? I seem to have ended up with two. Anybody who's been involved in medical malpractice litigation, each doctor has a lawyer, the hospital has a lawyer, um, all kinds of, there are all kinds of lawyers. It's just you and your attorney. And again, this is not a team kind of thing. It's everybody for themselves. Okay, now in Texas, specific, specific liability, everybody according to statute um, has to have $200,000, $600,000 malpractice insurance. Uh, usually each party is responsible only for the presented of their liability. So if there are three doctors and the jury says, you're 30%, you're 40%, you're you know, 20% or 30%, okay, fine, everybody pays their portion. However, if you have more than 50% liability, you can be held in terms of joint and several liability, which means you're responsible for the whole thing, and they tell you, okay, you're paying everything, you go after the other guy. All right, so again, it doesn't really affect us. The people who really get nailed on this are the hospitals, okay? Because if the guy doesn't have insurance, if the doctor doesn't have insurance and the hospital is supposed to say, well, the hospital is 60% liable. If the physician doesn't have insurance, a lot of times the hospital will become 100% liability. Therefore, that's why you have to have 2-6 insurance because the hospital is tired of holding the bag and, and you sort of can't blame them about that. Statute of limitations. Statute of limitations usually is about is two years in most places. It has various, it changes. Um, one thing, however, isn't different in any state, and that's fraudulent concealment. If you don't tell the patient something happened, the statute of limitations is forever. So in other words, you're doing uh, an aortic aneurysm, you're doing it open, which is for most of us a historic operation, you know, of, of interest only, we're doing it open, but so as you're doing an aorta open, and you get into the iliac vein, okay? You get into the iliac vein, you put a stitch in it, and it's better, that's fine. You don't really even have to put that in the operative report, you don't really have to do anything with that. However, if you get into the iliac vein, and you transfuse them 10 units of blood, you probably ought to tell that patient and the family that that's what happened. If they have a complication from that at a later date, and you don't tell that, you have fraudulently concealed that, and they can come after you two, three, five, 10, 15 years after that. So make sure you tell patients about those things. Again, wrongful death, the only reason I put that up here is because with wrongful death, people say, well, statute of limitations over, a patient died, but it's two years, I'm free. You may not be free. Sometimes it takes time to get letters or what we call letters of authority to get the person who's gonna represent the estate. So it may be longer than two years if you do have a wrongful death case. Okay. So what happens with a mental practice suit? What, what's the actual kind of, how does it go from A to B to C? All right, well, first thing you're gonna have is you're gonna have this pre-suit investigation. The lawyer's gonna go out and he's gonna get an expert. And he's gonna try to establish a standard of care and get an expert said you did something wrong. The next thing is you're gonna get what we call basically a notice of intent. And you do have this in Texas. So basically, what, this is what I like to refer to as people say, okay, uh, sort of almost like a stick-up letter. Either pay me money now or I'm gonna sue you. And that's really basically what this part is, is that you're either gonna to have to, if you wanna pay me something right now, then I won't file a suit against you. But I'm sending you this notice that I'm gonna sue you. What you have to remember about this notice of intent is they don't have to have an expert to do that. Now, they could have an expert that said maybe or whatever, but they don't have to name an expert. So theoretically, they could say they're gonna sue you and then not sue you. Uh, so. When you get a notice, don't all of a sudden start preparing for trial, because it may never even go to a complaint. Um, second thing is, then the third thing is you get the complaint. Now the complaint, any of you have ever read a complaint, 
it makes you look like the worst human being in the world. They list all these terrible things. They negligently let my patient die on the table and never tried to lift a finger, and they could have saved their life. I mean, it's just horrible to read. You should read it, but it's, it's painful to read, and you, go, and you get angrier and angrier as you're reading this thing. Um, then you have the interrogatories. And what happens is, in the interrogatories, the attorneys get to ask questions. They want to try to get information. So they'll send you a list of questions. And they will send you almost any kind. The courts are very lenient, unfortunately, about letting them ask you pretty much whatever they want to ask you. So, and, and lawyers, let me tell you, lawyers are, there are lawyers that are not so smart, but there are a lot of lawyers that are very smart and very good at what they do. And so they ask questions, the proverbial question, do you still beat your wife? Tough question to answer, okay? I mean, no, I don't anymore. Or, yeah, I do. I mean, you know. So you have to be careful how you answer these questions. Um, and then you do the discovery depositions, okay? Everybody's trying to, in a discovery deposition, they want to nail down what the defendant's going to say at trial, because nobody likes surprises. The classic teaching in law school is don't ever ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. Okay, that's the law school teaching. And basically what they're trying to do is they're also trying to evaluate you as a witness. They're trying to figure out, are you going to get rattled? Are you going to get angry? Are you going to present well to a jury? So that's why they do these discovery depositions. Before they do these discovery depositions, if they're good attorneys, they'll do their homework. They'll go to Google and they'll search your name and they'll look and see if there's anything there in Google. They will check your CV and see if what's on there. They'll read all of your past depositions to see what you've testified through to in the past. They will get all past legal problems. In Michigan, we have a thing called MIP, which is a minor in possession. He had a kid who's under 21, and he has a drink, gets caught by the police, they give him a minor in possession. That's come up at depositions for medical malpractice. When you were 18, weren't you busted by the police for drinking alcohol at a beer party? Yeah, okay. You know, I mean, but they will bring up anything and everything one, to try to make you look like the worst human being in the world. And number two is to rattle you and to sort of put you on edge. Um, however, the huge advantage that you have is that no matter how much an attorney reads, no matter how many experts he talks to, he or she can never know as much medicine as you do. And that's the advantage that you have. They can never know as much about your field as you know. But that doesn't mean that, you don't, that they don't think they do, and they don't try to show how smart they are. So let me give you, again, true questions. These are questions that were asked at trial. Attorney, not doctor, isn't it true that when a person dies in his sleep, he doesn't know about it until the next morning? Okay. Attorney, so the date of conception of the baby was August 8th. Yes. And what were you doing at that time? <laughs> You are not shot in the fracas? No, I was shot midway between the fracas and the navel. Are you qualified to give a urine specimen? Been qualified since childhood to give a urine specimen. Doctor, how many autopsies have you performed on dead people? All my autopsies are performed on dead people. This is my favorite. Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No. Did you check for blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. So it's possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy. No. Well, how can you be so sure, doctor? Well, because his brain was sitting in a jar uh, on my desk. But you see, they don't give up. But could the patient still have been alive nevertheless? And this is my favorite. It's possible he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere. <laughs> That's one of my favorite responses of all time. OK, rules for giving a deposition. Maintain your composure. It's just like if you're a surgeon in the operating room or if you're a cardiologist in the cath lab, you've got to maintain your composure. You've got to answer only direct questions. A lot of plaintiff's attorneys will say to you, so what do you think happened? And what they're doing is just sort of fishing. They want you to sort of say something that, you know, they, they can twist around and make it sound. So just answer direct questions. And answer only the question they ask, okay? They'll ask a question. 
you answer, you answer that question. If they say, what do you think happened? You say, well, I don't know what you mean. What, what do you mean what happened? What, what do you want to know? Ask, I'll be happy to answer any question. Um, never try to educate the plaintiff's attorney. This happens so often. Doctors think, you know, if I just make this guy understand, he'll drop this case. He just doesn't know that I did the right thing. I just got to make him understand that. Forget it. It ain't happening. You will never make him understand, all right? So don't try to educate the plaintiff's attorney. Um, there are things that um, uh, I've had cases where patient, uh, plaintiff attorney, so Dr. Brown, this doctor in this case that you reviewed, he did a bypass from the uh, femoral artery to the popliteal vein, and this is what happened. And I'll go, no. He didn't? No. So now he's all crazy. Well, what are you talking about with this whole case? He says, and then usually, unfortunately, the defense attorney will say, uh, did you mean popliteal artery? And they go, oh, yeah, 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 popliteal artery. He goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, he did do a bypass of the popliteal artery. So I offer nothing to these people in terms of I don't help them out one iota, and I would suggest that you don't either. Answer what he asks you, and that's it. Um, and again, be prepared. It's been said, and again, this is, I think, a really true quote. More cross-examinations are suicidal than homicidal, okay? Again, be very, very careful. Lack of concentration, like anywhere in medicine, can be fatal. Uh, as far as the conduct of the rest of the trial, then you usually have a case evaluation, settlement conference, and then it will or will not go to trial if you don't settle. What I get asked all the time is, can I sue the plaintiff's attorney for filing a frivolous lawsuit? The answer to that is, in general, no. Now, if, they, if you want to file a case for a malicious prosecution, you can occasionally do that, or lawsuits filed in violation of the court rules, yeah, you can sometimes do that, but basically you can't. What you can do, and again, it's really a little bit more than uh, we would need to go into today, what you can do, though, is go after that expert witness and make sure you take that expert witness and send in something to your society that says, hey, this is what this guy testified to, I really think this guy should be investigated and really probably ought to be kicked out of society. That you can do and you should do. Another question I always get asked. If I settle a case, am I admitting that I committed malpractice? The answer to that is a definitive no. You are not admitting malpractice. Basically what you're saying is, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Okay? I don't want to talk about it. You, get, you pay so much money, it's over, I didn't commit malpractice but I don't really want to go through this. Now, what's the advantages of settling a case? Obviously, there's no loss of time going to trial. What's it going to cost you as a clinician to go sit in trial? They got to pick a jury, then you got to try the case. How much is that going to cost you? And you've already paid your malpractice insurance, so you've already put that money out there. So you want to spend more money on top of that by missing your practice? That's something you have to think about. There's no risk of excess personal liability. In other words, you go into this and you go to a trial, and the guy says, well, okay, I'll settle for, you know, 100000 50000 75000 And say it's a death case, but you didn't do anything wrong. That jury could say, well, this guy was young and he died. We're going to fine for $2 million or whatever. Now you have not only lost your malpractice, you've got to pay out of your own pocket. So you've got to be careful that you don't want to subject yourself to excess personal liability. If you settle a case, you are not admitting any type of liability. And in fact, there is no finding a liability. You've got to remember that if you go through the end of the, to the end of the case and you are found liable, that sticks with you forever. So somebody says, yeah, have you ever been involved in a malpractice? Yeah, I was found guilty of being negligent. Whether you were or you won't, that sticks with you forever. So you, again, I'm not telling you to settle every case because I would not settle every case. There are certain cases that you should go to trial and see through to the end. What I'm saying to you, it's a business decision. Unfortunately, a lot of physicians will go, I'm going to court. I'm going to defend my reputation. You know, I, I don't want uh, any, I want to have this blemish on my medical reputation. Don't be silly. You're in business. This is a business decision. Make the smart business decision and not uh, an emotional decision. Um, so obviously, the best thing to do is to avoid being sued. The problem is you can't avoid being sued. So what do you do? Well, you know how to avoid obvious risks, the types of things that we've talked about here this morning. 
you understand the basic legal concepts of a medical malpractice suit and how you can help your attorney. You, again, know when to hold them and when to fold them, when you're going to go to court and when you're going to say, you know what, let's settle this case and let's get on with my practice. And then finally, and most important, document, 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 document. The more you document, the better off you're going to be. Again, Alan, thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to start taking some questions. But let me ask you a couple of questions, first of all. And that was a statement you made last night. You said, we think plaintiff's attorneys are the problem. You said, no, plaintiff's attorneys are not the problem. That's correct. Why don't you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. As we, as we went through here in the beginning, I talked about the four components. And the first component is there, is that, or second component, you have to establish that the physician violated the standard of care. Well, how is that done? In over 90 plus, 95 percent, 98 percent, another physician has to go in there and say they violated the standard of care. The attorney can't file the case if he doesn't have somebody who says, hey, this guy committed malpractice. So in truth, it's your colleagues. It's not the plaintiff's attorneys who are causing these problems. It's your colleagues who are saying this is malpractice. So that's why I strongly believe that this is misplaced. Um, the, this anger at the plaintiff's bar and the plaintiff's attorneys. They don't know one way or the other whether it's malpractice or not. As an attorney, your duty is this. You have a client who comes in and says, I've got damages, okay? And they've got a physician-patient relationship. And you now have a physician who says, yeah, I'll testify. You now have an obligation as an attorney to take that case. I got a patient, I had an operation, I had a patient had a procedure, they had a complication, I got an expert who says it's negligence. If I turn that down, I'm committing malpractice as an attorney. Now, I can send it away to another attorney and say, hey, there's, I think it's a good case, but I'll go somewhere else. But again, so the focus has to be on our profession, the med my, one of my professions, the medical profession, and not the legal profession. So, I'm sure there's questions, but while we're, put your hand up if you've got a question so we can get the microphone to you. But uh, one other thing while we're doing this, uh, Bill, was you're very strong about societies and the role of the expert witness. <clears throat> you want to really comment on why you think societies in general fail to help uh, police this? It, it's very interesting, and, and I would suspect that many of you who have been involved in litigation or whatever, once the case is over and you've won or prevailed, you go, okay, great, you're happy. How many go on now and go and take that expert witness who testified against you and said things obviously that weren't untrue and then pursue that? Send their name to the medical board, send their name to the society. Very few people do it. Almost nobody does it because they're so glad it's over. They just say, oh, okay, it's fine. It's over. I'm out. I don't want to worry about it. But what happens is, is that person keeps doing the same thing over and over again to your colleagues. And the only way to stop them is to get them censured or kicked out of their national society. There is precedent for this. There was a doctor, a neurosurgeon, the American Society of Neurologic Surgeons, who was testifying falsely against neurosurgeons. And to their credit, two or three neurosurgeons went to the society and said, listen, look at this deposition testimony. This guy's obviously lying. He's not telling the truth. We want him kicked out of the society. Society looked at it, and they kicked him out of the society for six months. Um, he went to, what happened was, he then went to and sued the society, saying that they kicked him out because he was testifying against doctors. It went to the Sixth Circuit Federal Court, and the judge in that case said, not only is it, not only are they allowed to do it, not only is the society allowed to do that, it's their responsibility to do that. So there is precedent. You got to remember, it may not seem too severe. Well, they kicked him out for six months. Okay, they kicked him out for six months, but he's now done as an expert witness. Because every time he goes to testify, the defense attorney says, well, doctor, have you ever been kicked out of a society for testifying falsely? He goes, yeah. Okay, fine. No more questions. <laughs> you know, if you're sitting on a lay jury, what, what do you think they're going to think? They go, oh, you mean you lied once? It is a question about <clears throat> more about outpatient practice and something that has always bothered me. Patients, we treat a lot of patients for chronic management, uh, preventive medicine. Uh, somebody has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, a lot of risk factors. He, he sees me once or twice. I 
give him advice, medication, change of lifestyle, etc. Then he disappears. He doesn't show up for next year. I kept keep hoping he'll come back. Two years pass, whatever. And then he has an adverse event. My question to you, and, and you know, it's a societal question too, is who is responsible? Am I a physician? Am I supposed to run after them and uh, drag them back to the office? Or is it their responsibility to make sure that they follow up? I guess the, the best way I can answer that is, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of both. And the reason I say that is this. You have this patient, and it depends, obviously, how urgent the follow-up is. In other words, the patient has a, a, blood, a, a cholesterol of 700 or something like that, you know, or whatever. If it's very urgent or emergent, they've got to come back in a, a week or two. That's one thing. But just in general follow-up, they have the responsibility. Your responsibility comes in and you say, okay, you see this patient, he, he changes blood pressure medication. It's very high, and he's supposed to come back in a week or two weeks, and he doesn't show up. You have the responsibility to have, you know he's on your list there. He doesn't show up. You have a responsibility to have your office call that guy and say, listen, you know, you had an appointment today, you didn't show up. And he doesn't answer or whatever. Now you write in the chart, patient told or called patient and again reminded him, you're now done. You've now fulfilled that responsibility. On your initial note on the chart, what you need to say is, have explained the patient the serious and, in fact, life-threatening consequences of him not following up. Patient states that he understands. So really, you're just, again, laying a foundation, laying a record, and saying, hey, I told you, and in fact, even called you once, and you didn't show up. You really pretty much then have no liability anymore. You're, you're now out of the loop. And I don't think, again, I, I can't think of any cases where a physician has been found liable for not following up repeated times. Next question. Uh, we have multidisciplinary conferences between surgery, interventional cardiology, structural disease, which are now you know, recommended for complex interventions, whether it's valvular or coronary. And there's multiple opinions that are raised, and we don't always reach a consensus. Uh, obviously, the surgeon and the cardiologist that are seeing the patient are going to end up making the decision. But should these, be, should these conversations be documented, or is anyone liable at any point? Well, <clears throat> those conversations absolutely should be documented. And the cardiologist who makes the decision should say, listen, we discussed um, these, we discussed this case. These possibilities were raised. In, ev in evaluating this, I believe that this is the best approach. Some people have the erroneous belief that, in other words, suppose you have a way, of th they talk about three ways of treating a specific entity. And some people believe that, well, I'm not going to put down the other two ways because maybe nobody will realize that there are other two ways. If something goes wrong, they won't be able to hold that against me. What, are you kidding me? I mean, there are a lot of smart people out there. And they know that other ways. These are knowledgeable things. People here know them. People, a lot of places know those ways. So the best way to defend yourself is to let subsequent court, jury, whatever, say, hey, listen, I get it. I know that there are other ways to do this. It wasn't that I didn't think about it. It wasn't that I was negligent, that I wasn't thinking about these things. I thought about it. This is what I decided to do. Basic malpractice law is you cannot be held liable for medical malpractice for a judgment. If you're making a pure judgment, you can't be held liable for medical malpractice. And so that's what you want to do, is you want to clearly on that chart make it clear that, hey, there are several options. This is my judgment. Oh, I'm sorry. This is my judgment. This is what I decided to do. Thanks. Dr. Rubin. I am, uh, I'm going to add on to Dr. to the other, the other outpatient. We have a lot of situations where patients, um, because of their coverage of their insurance, can't get a procedure done that you recommended or can't get a medication because it's not covered by their insurance. Um, what is the physician liability in that case? What do we, what do we document? First of all, it's obvious we need to document that. But what has, has there been any precedent for li physician liability in those kind of cases? The thing is this, is that if you think a patient needs to have a procedure and they can't, they don't have insurance for it, you have to tell that patient you need to have this done. They say, well, you know, I don't need, I don't, uh, I don't have insurance. What, and I'll give you a, a superficial example. 
patient ha needs to have some type of uh, Doppler evaluation for a deep vein thrombosis or whatever. And the patient says, well, I don't have coverage for the Doppler. I, I don't want to do the Doppler exam. You can't say, well, you don't have coverage. Eh, you know what? We'll, we'll forget it. It's probably okay. You know, I'm not going to order the Doppler then. If you don't have insurance, I won't order it. Or you don't have insurance, I won't order the CT scan. You now have assumed that liability. The fact that because the insurance company is going to say to you, their response to these cases, and there is case law about this, the insurance company is going to say, hey, I didn't tell you not to get the scan. You know, we're not saying you shouldn't get the scan. Don't hold us responsible. We're just saying we're not going to pay for it. Okay? But it's not our responsibility. We didn't tell you not to order it. So you're going to have the responsibility. So what you have to do is order it. If the hospital doesn't want to do it, the insurance company doesn't want to pay for it, okay, that's on them now. The responsibility is their responsibility, not your responsibility. But there's been no precedent. There's been no uh, cases where the insurance company has been found liable or if the or if a physician on the other end of the insurance company, you say you want to get a procedure and the, in the, in the patient, and the insurance, uh, excuse me, the, the physician on the insurance company, for the insurance company says, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to pay for that. There is a case in California where an um, insurance company would not pay for extended days in the hospital. Physician, patient was in the hospital. They said, um, physician said, you know, he needs to be in the hospital. And the insurance company says, well, we're not paying for any more days. He said, well, okay, if you're not going to pay for them, I'll discharge them. They discharged him. He had a complication. And the physician was held liable, not the insurance company. Let me ask, so there's a pretty heterogeneous group of people who work here. Some are in pure private practice. Some are employed by the hospital. Talk, can you talk a little bit about hospitals versus physicians in a malpractice suit? Yeah, and there are in hospitals, a lot of hospital situations, one of the alternatives or one of the uh, things that you can have is you can have if you're, again, if you're working for the hospital, the hospital is liable for you. And so there's really not an issue in those kind of cases. The hospital assumes liability, they buy the insurance policy, et cetera. Where it gets a little complex is that many hospitals will offer insurance policies if you buy the insurance policy and do joint um, uh, coverage with the hospital. So in other words, you go to the hospital, the hospital says, all right, we'll provide malpractice insurance and we'll give it to you at a lower rate, but if there's a lawsuit, we're partners, okay? We're going to do this as joint. We're going to have one lawyer. It's going to be the hospital and the physician together. Now, what they get you with that is they say, well, it's a lot cheaper. The problem is there is a significant potential liability there. There was a case in Michigan and this is a case that I happen to unfortunately know about physicians involved. A uh, physician did uh, an aortobifemoral bifemoral bypass graft. <clears throat> unfortunately, things went very wrong. And the patient subsequently ended up with bilateral below the knee amputations. The patient sued the hospital and the physician. And the hospital and the physician had joint coverage. The, the physician had bought his coverage through the hospital and they, they uh, defended it together. Well, the hospital attorney presented the case. Um, the plaintiff attorney presented his case. Hospital attorney, who was also the doctor's attorney, came in there and said, hey, you know what? You got to let my hospital out of here. You know, the hospital really didn't do anything. You got to let the hospital out. And the judge said, okay, fine. So now the doctor's there by himself, okay? What happened was is that they found a judgment, I think, for $32 million against the doctor alone he was out there by himself. Now, obviously, they didn't collect $32 million, but they um, <clears throat> uh, froze all his assets. Um, it was, uh, it didn't get any paychecks for a while. I mean, it was a terrible situation. So you've got to be very careful. And if you have joint coverage with a hospital or a clinic, be very careful. And sometimes it may be better to get your own attorney in those kind of situations. Arvind. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, thank you for, for the Great overview, and I think your perspective of both sides makes it uh, good for us. I, I, two questions. One is a corollary to what Man asked. You know, we deal with transplants, VADs, and also the interventional world. We're getting more into a group decision-making model where these committees, like we always say, oh, the committee made the choice, but there are people in the committee. Um, so the legal obligation-wise, the individuals of the committee are independently liable or if some if some decision is questioned 
does that become, because we document and the one person signs saying, oh, this is what we did in the committee. So when you have those kind of committees, and we have a similar kind of thing, we, much as you have here, we have a complex aortic surgery conference. And we will discuss complex aortic cases and come to a consensus. However, if it's my case, I'm making the final decision. Um, I will put down, whether everybody agrees or not agrees, I will put down case discussed at Beaumont Hospital Complex Aortic Surgery Conference. These were the points that were raised in view of this, and I put down why I decided to do what I was going to do. And so again, it's documentation. You know, make sure, and I would clearly, in other words, if you come, the consensus of your committee is to do A. I would clearly make sure that's in the chart. Patient's case discussed at such and such, this was the consensus of the committee. I think that's an important component. And my other question is the usual situation of against medical advice when patients leave. A lot of times I see that when they leave, the oh, it's like he left, so we don't have to do anything. But I'm, if I'm not wrong, you're still obligated to give him prescriptions, give a follow-up, and make sure that you, you do things that need an appropriate outpatient follow-up. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's sort of case dependent. In other words, um, what you have to, again, it comes to the law, it gets complex. So the arguments go this way. If you give him those things, the argument will say, well, but you treated him. You obviously thought this was okay because you gave him all the treatments and stuff like that. The other way to say is, I'm not, and, and the other way to say is, I'm not giving him anything. Well, somebody will look at that and go, well, you couldn't give him anything? I mean, if you'd have given him something, you'd have been okay. I would argue that, you know what, I would give the patient whatever you think is reasonable to give them. And if they go home AMA, they go home AMA, and you say, okay, patient went home AMA. I do not think it's safe for them to go home. I think they are at increased risk. I've explained to those patients. I have given them these prescriptions uh, in hopes that, you know, they'll at least do this, but I do not think this is the appropriate care. And now you've documented that. And the problem is we all know that, but we all can't go find a computer and write it down the same. They call you up and say, you know, Mr. So-and-so is going home AMA. Great. I can't w get him out of here. Send him out. Okay? But then you don't go right up and write that chart, that note. So, so Bill, before we get to you, Majib, uh, yeah. one slide you had document, document, document. Let me ask you about the electronic medical record. It seems to me like that's what we do. And that basically is potentially a big problem. I mean, you talked a little bit last night about the dangers of the electronic medical record. And I think, you know, we went on Epic, I guess, just over a year ago now. Talk a little bit about cutting and pasting and, and the amount of stuff that is, that is being moved around the medical record. Yeah. The, um, despite what we think most of the time, a lot of people in the government are not stupid. They sort of get this, okay? And they're starting to look, these frauds, they're starting to look at these notes. And people are saying, okay, some physicians have said, okay, well, we got to have these components, no problem. They put together an electronic note and they keep moving it from patient A to patient B to patient C to make sure they have all the components so you can get paid. I can't tell you how many charts I've looked at um, in reviewing for medical malpractice cases where the patient has palpable pedal pulses and has a right BKA, okay? I mean to tell you. Those are really sensitive fingertips. You know, I mean, really. I mean, come on. Right BKA and they got palpable pedal pulses. That's what we get into with these medical records. And, and you get into a situation where, you know, you've got your chart and you've got your basic record. And you maybe make a few tweaks here, but then you forget to make a tweak. Or a patient has a little bit different. Um, so I guess I'm not saying completely abandon medical records because they're here to stay and that's what's going to happen. But use them wisely and take the extra time, which none of us want to do. Medical rec electronic medical records has added literally hours to all of our days, okay, in terms of trying to get this done. But unfortunately, they're here to stay, so you just sort of have to deal with it. And you have to make sure that the note says what you want it to say. Lawyers love the electronic medical record. They think it's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. All right, last question. Majib? Yeah, so my question is, can I go back to the charge and document something which I missed? For example, a primary care physician asked me to prescribe anticoagulation on his behalf because he's not in the hospital, and you're just trying to help that patient get out of the hospital. The patient needs to go home, and I forgot about documenting. 
like, can you go back like from a previous encounter and say, I have had a conversation with Dr. X and he recommends prescribing this, which I have done and given the instructions to the patient? Probably not after the suit's been filed, okay? okay. <laughs> but, but before the suit's been filed, you can probably do that. All right. okay. Thanks Thank very you. much. That was very, very excellent. <laughs>